welcome to Peninsula Seniors Out and About. We're at the Western Museum of Flight in Torrance. Let's go see what Cindy has for us today. Welcome everyone to the Western Museum of Flight. I'm Cindy Maka, the director. Today, for our speaker, we have a recognized expert whose broad experience combined with his keen intellectual interest in the subject has made him uniquely qualified to inform us about the lives and work of the pioneers of rotor wing flight and the technologies and companies that they foster. Ladies and gentlemen, Lieutenant Commander Chip Lancaster, United States Navy, retired. Good afternoon, my name is Chip Lancaster. I was uh, uh, in the Navy for 24 years and I've been teaching for the Navy for the last 28 years, teaching uh, helicopter pilots at the Naval Air Station at North Island how not to crash into your house. <laughs> so I hope you appreciate that aspect. Anyway, to, uh, today we're gonna talk about the helicopter pioneers. And this is gonna be really quick. Basically, we're just scratching the surface. We could spend easily several hours talking about any one of these uh, pioneers individually. So I'm gonna go through six pioneers and over 80 of their aircraft as we uh, cycle through this uh, history lesson. There's gonna be a test at the end, so I want everybody to pay attention. <laughs> but we're gonna start it off this way. The of the helicopter was one of the biggest attractions to the machine for its inventor. A vertical lift aircraft could be outstandingly valuable and successful for saving life. That was one of my dreams. I wanted to do that as long as I'm alive. Even if it's the last big job which I did in my life, which perhaps it will be. I think it was besides other things. It had to me a sort of a romantic or philosophical appeal. The appeal is this. What kind of a gadget or machine or vehicle or so forth can give you unlimited freedom of transportation? And that was Igor Sikorsky our founding father of uh, rotary wing aviation here in the United States. So the only pioneers I'm talking about are US pioneers. There was pioneers worldwide. But Igor was the founding father, and we'll be going through all those in a minute. But uh, in paraphrasing what he continued on to say, he said, if a man is in need, the airplane can come in and throw him some flowers. That's about it. A directive aircraft, which is what he called a helicopter, could come in and save his life. The helicopter can contact any place on the ground, on water, absolutely any place. The helicopter is the only thing that can do that. So Igor was very passionate on rotary wing aviation. And don't think that he's disparaging fixed wing aviation. As you'll see, he had quite a career uh, designing and building fixed wing aircraft during his life. So we'll start off, uh, get right on, uh, to it here. Incidentally, that's the uh, front of our museum. We'll talk more about that at Ramona Airport. So let's talk about the pioneers. So we start off with Igor Sikorsky from 1889 to 1972. As I said, he was the old man. Now by old, I mean he was in his 40s. So basically in his mid 40s to uh, early 50s, this is when he did most of his uh, development in rotary wing aviation. But he was the resident expert. He was the guru on the mountain. If you wanted helicopter knowledge firsthand from the horse's mouth, so to speak, you went to Igor, so he had to climb the mountain to do that. The rest of our pioneers were the young guns, so they were all in their 20s and 30s and even one teenager. So this is Frank Piasecki. Now Frank was the P.T. Barnum of uh, helicopter development. He was a showman and a salesman. He could sell anything to anybody. Uh, and he looked much older. He looked a whole generation older than he was, which really helped him to garner uh, Department of Defense contracts to uh, help him build his rotary wing aircraft. Our next young gun, young so to speak, this is Arthur Young. So Arthur was actually in his uh, 30s. So he was a little bit older than the rest of the young guns, but younger than uh, Igor. And he wasn't an aeronautical engineer, an aviator, a pilot. He was a mathematician, a philosopher, and an inventor. And he had his own unique aspect to developing a rotary wing aviation, as you'll see as we go along. 
Our next young gun is the true young gun. This is Stanley Hiller. And Stanley started off when he was a teenager in rotary wing development. Uh, he was sort of an intuitive, mechanical, uh, and inventive genius. His father was an aeronautical uh, engineer who uh, built airplane engines, so he had a whole machine shop at home, uh, which Stanley learned how to use. And so, just to give you some idea, when he was just a teenager in high school, he had a $100,000 annual uh, profit company that he was running out of the attic of his parents' house building gasoline-powered uh, race cars for other uh, students and uh, acquaintances. And he even garnered a contract, he and his father did, during World War II, uh, building certain uh, metal parts for uh, uh, our fighters and bombers. And we'll get more into Stanley as we go along. He was also the only helicopter pioneer on the west coast of the United States. So our next one is uh, Charlie Command right here, who started out in his mid-20s in his mom's garage uh, with uh, Command Aircraft uh, Corporation. He had a, his own unique aspect too. So he developed the uh, servo flap method for uh, rotary wing control. So controlling a helicopter is one thing, and there's a standard way to do it, and there's a non-standard way to do it, which was pretty much uh, Charlie's way to do it. But it was successful. It's still working today, as you'll see it. He also had many firsts. He was the first uh, pioneer to put a gas turbine engine in a helicopter. He was the first pioneer to actually build a full-scale radio-controlled helicopter, remote-controlled helicopter by radio signal, and he was the first one to use all composite rotor blades. He also built guitars, so he had a successful company doing that. Our last young gun really isn't a young gun in the other way that we were referring to the other ones, but this is uh, our later day pioneer. So the first ones were our early pioneers. This is uh, Frank Robinson, who's more a modern day pioneer. Uh, he's the next generation of helicopter pioneers. And he learned his rotary wing uh, expertise through 16 years of on the job training. He was also the first pioneer to realize all of the other pioneers' dreams, and that was to build a helicopter that anybody could fly, anybody could afford, and anybody could use, a helicopter in every garage. That was all of their dreams, and uh, Frank Piasecki was the first one to actually ut uh, utilize that dream. Okay, let's get into them individually. So this is Igor Sikorsky. He was born in 1889, when, but when he was only about eight or nine years old, he read a book by Jules Verne. In the book, uh, Robert the Conqueror, they had this amazing machine that could rise vertically off the ground by means of rotors, lifting it up and then uh, move around wherever he wanted it. And so that was his dream, to someday build an aircraft like that that could take off vertically off the ground and just go wherever he wanted it to do. And he actually attempted to do that. Back in 1909 and 1910, he and his father in 1909 actually went to Paris. So Paris was the hub of uh, aeronautical expertise on the European continent. If you wanted to know anything about Paris, anything about Paris, right, anything about aircraft, that's where you went. That's where they all congregated. And he and his father went there to meet the aviators and uh, talk to them and uh, actually acquire parts to build a helicopter. Uh, he took all the parts, went back to Russia, and he built his first helicopter, the H-1. Uh, however, it had uh, tremendous vibration problems, which he wasn't uh, able to overcome, but he wasn't dissuaded. The next year, he got a loan from his sister. He went back to Paris because he heard that the Wright brothers were going to be in town, and he actually got to talk to the Wright brothers in Paris and the other uh, fixed-wing pioneers of the day. In fact, several of the fixed-wing pioneers tried to dissuade him from building a helicopter. He said, no, nah, that's not going to be the way to go. It's not going to work. You have to get into fixed-wing aviation. Well, Igor didn't let that uh, uh, dissuade him. He bought a 25-horsepower Anzani engine, motorcycle engine, and took it all back to Russia and built his second helicopter, the H-2. And that's a picture of it up there on the screen. 
And the uh, H2 actually was able to get up into the air only a couple of inches, but he just didn't have the power uh, to get it up into the air, especially if anybody was on it. It weighed 450 pounds. But one of the things that he did do was he uh, took the Wright brothers' advice and he used wing warping. In other words, bending the wings as a method of controlling his rotor system. He also realized the problem of uh, torque. So when you turn the rotors one way, the rest of the helicopter wants to go the other way. So both of Igor's design were what we call coaxial. They were two uh, rotors turning by this, uh, powered by the same engine, but turning in opposite directions, which cancels the torque effect. So he had already solved that problem. Okay. He went on to then uh, join uh, a company, the, in fact, the Russian Baltic Railroad Car Works actually hired him as their aircraft division chief when he was only uh, 23 years old. So he started making airplanes just in his early 20s. When he was 21, he made his first airplane. And these are fixed wing airplanes of the day. They start with the S1, so all of his airplanes are uh, prefixed with that letter S and then a number of the aircraft. Well, by the time uh, 1913 rolled around, he had developed a four-engine passenger-carrying airplane. In fact, at the time, this was the biggest airplane in the world. Uh, just to give you some idea of its size, it's over 65 feet long with a wingspan of over uh, 90 feet. It could carry seven passengers in luxury and even had a, a promenade deck up on the front where passengers could go out into the wind and observe the ground passing underneath them and take the wind. Keep in mind, it's only flying at about 50 knots. But by the time World War I was uh, on the horizon there, uh, he reworked his Legrand. It was called the Legrand, but he worked it into a four-engine bomber called the Ilya Muromets. And the Ilya Muromets was about the same size. He used bigger engines on it. It could carry up to a 1,400-pound bomb load. So it was the, the world's first bomber of this size. And one interesting aspect, in the words of his son, Sergei Sikorsky, he said, uh, you could, they were easy to fly, but you had to know what you were doing because the takeoff speed, the landing speed, the cruise speed, and the stall speed were all the same. So they only varied by about a knot. So you really had to know what you were doing when you were flying one of these behemoth aircraft. And in the day, they were true behemoths. Well, by 1917, the Bolsheviks were coming into town uh, trying to get rid of anybody that had any knowledge. So Igor and his family left Russia. They went to Paris. And by 1919, they were in uh, New York City pretty much penniless, but not without knowledge. So Igor uh, became a math teacher in New York City, which is sort of how I have my affinity with Igor Sikorsky. So Igor Sikorsky graduated from the Russian Naval Academy, and he was also a math teacher. I graduated from the US Naval Academy, and I teach math. So I have sort of an affinity along with uh, Igor right there. But by the time he was about uh, 34 years old, he had acquired enough capital to establish his own aircraft company, the Sikorsky Manufacturing Company in Roosevelt, New York. And he built this airplane that you see on the screen right there. So that's his S-29. So keep in mind between one and 29, there's 28 aircraft in there that he had already designed and flown. So this was a 14-passenger airliner. He only built one. Uh, that's all he had enough capital for, and he sold it to a private individual, Roscoe Turner, who was a showman of the time, and unfortunately, it was actually destroyed in a crash, uh, making a Howard Hughes movie, Hell's Angels. So if you ever watch that movie, you'll see this aircraft in it. Well, he wasn't dissuaded. He went on to build bigger and better things, and uh, by 1928, he came out with the uh, S-38 Sesqua plane, an amphibious plane. And he, his company made over 100 of these, so they were used worldwide by lots and lots of people. It was a very successful amphibious plane. Well, he liked the idea of flying boats, so he continued with that. And by 1934, he had built his S-42, the Pan Am Clipper. So now he had a plane that could carry up to 30, uh, 37 passengers and actually had provisions for 14 sleeping berths. It had a 1,200-mile range, so it could go transatlantic, trans-Pacific, down to South America, anywhere basically Pan Am or other aircraft companies wanted to go. 
He continued with that, getting bigger and better, and by 1937 had built his VS-44, which is an anti-submarine flying boat, and they used it throughout World War II and after uh, for that mission. In fact, the Navy actually flew it up until 1968, so it was actually flying around for quite a time. But by the mid-30s, he actually became a subdivision of United Aircraft Corporation. They were interested in rotary wing aircraft. This was during, uh, actually, uh, before World War II. The, uh, the Germans were flying rotary wing aircraft throughout World War II. They flew their first successful one in 1936. Well, Igor wanted to get back into this vein. He developed his VS-300, and uh, here's a little video of that. America sees another new marvel of aviation, the Sikorsky helicopter. The takeoff, 90 degrees straight up. This experimental model, a veteran of hundreds of test flights, goes aloft to attempt to break the world's endurance record for flight over one spot. So that was Igor's first helicopter, the VS-300, uh, VS, uh, which was flown in 1939. Now one of Igor's trademarks is that he always wore a fedora, a felt fedora. You can see him, he's wearing it in that picture right there, but he was always wearing it when he flew. He never wore a crash helmet. Uh, but he was always wearing that felt fedora, and that was his trademark. Well, he went on to further develop the VS-300, and they came out with the uh, R-4 Hoverfly in 1942, which was the only U.S. helicopter to fly in the war. But it flew in the China-Burma Theater from 1943 to 1945, doing uh, search and rescue, uh, medevac operations, and uh, light logistics operations. So it was quite successful. It was also fabric covered, even had fabric covered blades. But uh, he kept developing, he developed his first all metal helicopter here, the S-51, or called the HO-3S by the Navy, which is a, a small three-place helicopter, but did uh, extensive uh, search and rescue work uh, during the Korean War. In fact, if you've ever seen the movie, The Bridges of Toko Ri, this is what Mickey Rooney is flying in that movie. That, incidentally, is the best naval aviation movie ever made. I guarantee it. Well, he continued on, and by 1950s, was getting bigger and better with his S-55. Now, there's a, a lot of uh, humorous stories with uh, Igor and his company. And the story with the S-55 is, one day he was sitting down at lunch with his engineers. And Igor was a notorious doodler. He loved to doodle, doodle all the time. So he had his napkin out there. He drew a box on his napkin. On top of the box, he drew a propeller. In the front of the box, he put an engine and a pilot. In the back of the box, he put a tail boom and a tail rotor. And he, told his, he gave it to his engineer, and he says, this is what I want, in that uh, Russian -ask accent that you heard earlier. And that's what they did. So center of gravity, CG displacement, was a big problem with helicopters. So now they put this big box. The center of gravity was right under the rotor system. Everything was balanced. You had the engine and the pilots over here, the tail rotor and tail boom out there. So everybody was, everything was balanced. Everybody was happy. And that was quite a successful aircraft. Even some models of it are still flying today with a turbine conversion. Well, he continued on, and by the early 1950s, he built a real beast of an aircraft, the S-56, also called the H-37 Mojave. So now we're talking about an aircraft that basically is 31,000 pounds max gross weight, can carry up to uh, 40 passengers or 10,000 pounds of cargo. And what made it extremely unique was it had these big clamshell doors up in the front that opened like that, and you could actually drive Jeeps and howitzers right inside. It also had a, a monorail cargo moving system inside. So it was quite innovative. Uh, in the terms of technology for its time. And we actually have one of these at our museum. If you come down there, we'll take you through it. Well, he continued on, and the aircraft that replaced the S-55 was the S-58. He got it bigger. He's using a bigger engine on this one, a 1,500-shaft uh, horsepower radial engine, but can carry now up to uh, 12 to 15 passengers. So this uh, flew extensively uh, between uh, Korea and uh, Vietnam, and it was the first uh, helicopter that the Marines used extensively in Vietnam. You can still see it flying today, uh, typically with a, a turbine engine conversion on it. 
But gas turbine engines started to roll in the scene in the early 1960s. And gas turbine engine technology, jet engine technology, was a tremendous boon for the helicopter industry. When jet engines came online, the designers and engineers just went crazy. So now the, uh, the S-58 before it had a 1,500 shaft horsepower engine. It was a nine-cylinder radial engine, but it also weighed 2,000 pounds, and it was quite massive. So now in the S61, he could take a 300-pound gas turbine engine that put out 1,500 shaft horsepower and was uh, significantly smaller. He could use two of those. So for less than half the weight, he's getting more than twice the horsepower. You can put him right on time with on top of the aircraft with a transmission and rotor, uh, rotor system. And now you've got the whole bottom of the aircraft to do whatever you want with it. Notice he also has the boat hull on the S61, and you'll still see these flying today. So his uh, seaplane technology fed into his helicopter designs of the day. In fact, the presidential helicopter, Marine One, is an S61, so it's still flying today. We'll see the replacement aircraft for that as we go along also. Well, heavy lift was what the, both the military and civilian industry wanted. So uh, Sikorsky took out the whole fuselage, just left a basic frame on top, put a cockpit up in front. You could hang a crane right under the uh, rotor system and engines there, and they came out with the S-64 Sky Crane. So now I had uh, an aircraft that could pick up, pick up uh, 20,000 pounds. And it was so unique that the pilot sat up in front, the crane operator sat right behind them, and he could fly the airplane. So he had controls back there where he could operate the helicopter and fly it as he picked up a load. And you'll still see these flying today. So they use them for firefighting, uh, logging, all sorts of jobs where heavy lift is required. He continued on and beefed up the S-61 and came out with the S-80 or H-53. So this started out as a twin engine aircraft. Now the current H-53s is a three engine aircraft, but you're talking about an aircraft that can go as high as 70,000 pound max gross weight, pick up 36,000 pounds of cargo or up to 55 passengers. So you're talking about a real beast of an aircraft. And it can be used aboard ship with a folding rotor system. Continuing on, now keep in mind that Igor died in 1972, but his legacy, the history of his company and his designs continued on. So in the early 1970s, he comes out with the S-70 Blackhawk. Uh, and uh, so this is the SH-60 variant for the military. So all H-60s have Hawks as a, a, de as a uh, final part of their name. So the Army had the first one, the Blackhawk. They're flying today. Uh, at, uh, in the Navy, at North Island, and in the Army, with Special Forces. They're flying all over the world, so a lot of companies also use a variant of the S-70, but a quite successful uh, helicopter that uh, the Sikorsky company made. He continued on, uh, the company continued on then, by the early 1990s. Uh, had come out with what's called the S-92 Superhawk. So this was designed as a passenger aircraft, uh, passenger carrier, could carry up to 19 passengers or 7,000 pounds of cargo. And this is the one that's currently uh, looking to replace uh, the S-61 as Marine One, as the presidential helicopter. So I expect to see that uh, flying in that, uh, in that uh, job probably next year. Now they come out with the coaxial rotor system. So Sikorsky has gone 180, or 360, if you will. He started off with uh, coaxials back with his H1 and H2 uh, in Russia that never really got off the ground. And now the company's gone full circle and come out with the X2 coaxial. So another problem with helicopters, in addition to torque and center of gravity and engine power, is speed. Helicopters can't go that fast, and the reason they can't go that fast is because they develop shock waves, compressibility effects, on the advancing blade. So the advancing blade like this develops a shock wave, and they just don't have enough engine power to push everything through the shock wave and go any faster. So basically they're limited to about 150, 180 knots. So with modern computer technology and a coaxial rotor system now, I can feather the advancing blade so it's not producing any lift and just provide all lift on the retreating blade side 
on both sides. And with a pusher prop in the back, now I can push it in excess of uh, 200 knots without experience in compressibility effects. In fact, the X2 has gotten up to 250 knots. And right now it's an RD test and evaluation aircraft, and we'll see that's what that's developed into here in a minute. But they continued beefing up their aircraft and beefing up the H-53 and coming out with the H-53K, the King Stallion. Uh, largely composite aircraft. It's all fly-by-wire, triply redundant. Uh, but you're looking at an aircraft now that can pick up a 45,000-pound cargo load. But it has the same uh, footprint as the previous H-53. So that was the marine requirement. Still has to fit aboard ship. Uh, the same ship and the same footprint. So it has a folding rotor system, but now we're talking about a huge aircraft uh, that's looking at 180 knots of speed, but can pick up 45,000 pounds of cargo. So the coaxial system, though, has morphed into the S-97 Raider, which is an actual now developmental aircraft that the, uh, the military and possibly even corporate industry will be flying. So it uses the coaxial rotor system and a pusher prop on the back to get it in speeds in excess of 200 knots. Let's talk about Frank Piasecki. So Frank Piasecki was the original first young gun of the helicopter industry, starting his designs back in 1940. And the first one that he designed was the uh, PV-1 Notar. So again, a problem with helicopters is, is uh, torque. So to top, stop the uh, fuselage from turning, typically they'll put a, a small rotor blade in the back a tail called a tail rotor, which gives you anti-torque and yaw control. But a pro another problem with the tail rotor, though, is if you're operating in a low-level environment around trees and bushes and rocks and people, it's easy to run your tail rotor into something, and that'll break, and now all of a sudden your helicopter is broken and you're stuck. So all, all of the designers, and even today, experiment with ways to eliminate the tail rotor. And so that was uh, Frank's first design right here. We call it the no-tar for no-tail rotor. And it just used uh, compressed air. Uh, and he never built it, so he just designed it on paper. But the first helicopter that he did build was a, a main, single main rotor, tail rotor configured helicopter, similar to Sikorsky's uh, design. But this was unique to Frank. We have some video of it here. The first flights were encouraging enough to warrant the PV-2 being fitted with a complete skin. In its new streamlined form, it was rolled out for a continuing series of test flights. So you can see them rolling it out right there. The PV-2, with its dynamically balanced rotor blades and full cyclic pitch control, was seen by Piasecki as a technology demonstrator. As the designer and the pilot, he was in a perfect position to get it right. Now, one of the amazing things about the pioneers was he, nobody knew how to fly helicopters. Nobody in the whole world. So all of the designers taught themselves how to fly helicopters. How many people in here fly a helicopter? Yeah, what's the hardest thing to do? Hover, right? So when you learned how to hover, where'd you go? All over the place. And whoever was the instructor was probably biting his nails or uh, chewing his tongue, hoping that you didn't crash into something as you learned that. So that was the hardest thing to do. And that's what all of the pioneers taught themselves how to do. Another problem with the, the single rotor, tail rotor configuration was uh, not so much marketing, but uh, getting it patented. So in 1943, uh, Igor Sikorsky had already patented that basic design. So unless you did something significantly different to alter the design, you would have to pay him for patent rights in order to do it. And so all of the other engineers tried to do something different. And uh, Frank's uh, idea was he's going to go heavy lift all the way. So he's going to start off big and keep going in that direction. So he did, decided to build the PV-3 uh, dog ship right here, uh, which morphed into some other helicopters, as we'll see. But the military requirement for heavy lift at the time was 2,000 pounds. You had to lift a ton or you had to carry 10 passengers. And at the time, back there in the mid-1940s, helicopters were lucky if they could carry themselves and maybe two people at the most. So one ton was completely out of the picture. So uh, Frank decided to go in that direction. 
He was a showman. He was a showman first and foremost, after all. So he used the tandem rotor configuration, one rotor on each end, powered by the same engine, turning in opposite directions, which cancels out all the torque effect, and all of the limited engine power goes to the production of lift, which Frank was just happy about. So that's their first one. It's made with welded steel tubing. And so what they did was cover it with doped fabric for weight, uh, for weight consideration. The first uh, Department of Defense um, concern that wanted it was the Coast Guard. So they wanted it for search and rescue. And the Coast Guard wanted it painted yellow so it could be easily seen. So you can imagine what the reporters said when they saw this big yellow helicopter fly into the scene. The headlines were, Coast Guard gets flying banana. So ever since, a tandem rotor helicopters euphemistically have been called bananas. So there's big bananas, little bananas, they're all flying bananas. But the Coast Guard loved it, the Navy even flew a version of that, and, but he continued on. And instead of going bigger, he actually went smaller with his next one. So this is the uh, PV-14 uh, retriever, which was called the HUP uh, by the uh, Navy and it was a small, compact, all-metal helicopter. It was the first one to use total semi-monocoque uh, structural design uh, to be used aboard ship. So the Navy requirement was, I need something that's gonna fit on the elevator of the aircraft carrier without having to take the rotor blades off. So the rotor blades folded, it fit on the air aircraft carrier elevator, everybody was happy. In fact, uh, this type of helicopter flew well into the 1960s, and it was the first helicopter to carry an astronaut. So it actually transported John Glenn from the destroyer that picked him up back to the aircraft carrier. And we have both this and the HRP next to it in our museum. So you can see those if you come down to Classic Rotors. Well, Frank uh, decided uh, small is enough of that, I'm gonna go larger. So he went still larger still and came out with his uh, H-16 transporter. So the transporter was a huge tandem rotor aircraft. So it was 77 feet long with two 82 foot diameter rotor blades. So it was tremendously large for the time. It had two uh, 2,000 horsepower radial engines in it and a later variant had two gas turbine engines in it. Uh, it was designed to pick up 10,000 pounds of cargo or up to 47 passengers. Uh, unfortunately, one of them crashed uh, during the test and evaluation, so they canceled the rest of the program. And unfortunately, the surviving aircraft has uh, since been destroyed, so we don't have any surviving uh, models of that aircraft. But he went on to continue the uh, push the HRP into bigger and better things, and by the early 1950s, he came out with the uh, H-21 Shawnee, or called the workhorse by the Air Force. In fact, that's a picture of our classic rotors, H-21 Shawnee and Ramona. It's the only flying H-21 in the world, and it was a real workhorse for the day. Could carry 20 passengers, or up to uh, 12 stretchers for medical evacuation, or up to 5,000 pounds of cargo. So a, a real workhorse, workhorse for the day. Again, gas turbine technology uh, represented a boon to, uh, uh, to aircraft production for uh, Piasecki, and so we come out with the, uh, the BV-107. Now, Piasecki, his company changed hands numerous times. So in the early 1950s, he actually sold his company to his employees, so it became Vertol. And then by the late 1950s, Boeing had bought it, so now it became Boeing Vertol. So this is a BV-107, or the, the a military called it H4, an H-46. In fact, this is uh, one of the last ones that were flying in the Marines. They uh, discontinued all of their uh, H-46s back in 2015. So here I have an aircraft that flew from, the, uh, from basically 1960 up to 2015. So it had a quite extensive uh, career in the military. And they're still flying today in the civilian community. Uh, the Department of State is refurbishing old ones to fly them overseas. But uh, so this, uh, and what allowed them to do that was this gas turbine technology. So now I could have two engines for the price of one. I could have my whole fuselage. I could put a loading ramp in the back and just load on all sorts of cargo and people and everybody was happy. So he continued to push bigger and better and came out with the H-47 Chinook. 
So now a huge uh, tandem rotor helicopter being uh, over 50,000 pounds max gross weight could pick up 24,000 pounds of cargo or carry up to uh, 55 passengers. So a tremendous aircraft. In fact, they're still flying today. The Army loves them. They go everywhere with them. In fact, Boeing, if you can believe this, actually has contracts to build new H-47s up to the year 2030. 2030, we think this is gonna be the first century helicopter. It's gonna be the first helicopter with over 100 years of service. Well, some of the innovations that uh, Piasecki came out with, again, was uh, speed was the big thing. So he came out with this PA-16 Pathfinder, which has a ducted prop, pusher prop on the back. So a ducted fan pusher prop on the back for speed and maneuverability. Also has small wings. So you can uh, sort of see the wings in that picture. But the wings would uh, develop more lift and forward flight, which means I can unload the rotor system and actually slow it down and use the pusher prop to get higher speeds. So here back in the early 1960s, he had a rotary wing aircraft that could go 200 knots, which was unheard of for the time. And we'll see that how that's pushed further here in a minute. But he was also uh, an innovator uh, in addition to being a showman. And one of the things he came out with for the Army was the PA-59 uh, Air Jeep. So the Army wanted something that could take stuff around the battlefield uh, and not go very far or very high, but uh, just lift up vertically, go over obstacles and stuff like that. Uh, so he came out with the uh, Air Jeep right here, which could carry three passengers or up to 600 pounds. Well, the Army figured it would probably be too cumbersome and uh, too much of a problem on the battlefield, so it never went into full production. But it was one of the innovations that Piasecki came up with. So he still continued on with the pusher prop uh, technology and put one on an S-70, which is interesting. So he put one on a Sikorsky aircraft. So this is actually an H-60 Foxtrot that he got from the Navy. So it has, uh, you can see this, the small wings on this one rather clearly, and the prop in the back. So this is the uh, X-49 Speedhawk. Again, it's a hawk because it's part of that H-60 line. So Piasecki, Piac, Piasecki Aircraft Corporation is still a viable company working out of uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Now I have the uh, V-22 Osprey. So the Osprey is a Bell Boeing product, but now Boeing actually owns uh, Vertol, which was before Piasecki, but the, the heritage is still there. In fact, if you're familiar with both the H-46 and the V-22, and you walk from one to the other, you go into the back of the V-22 and you go, oh, this is an H-46 which has uh, uh, tilt rotors on it. And that was basically the Marine criteria. They wanted an H-46 that could go farther and faster and carry a little bit more. So that was part of the design criteria in coming up with the uh, V-22 tilt rotor. So we'll see that a little bit more later when we talk about Bell. But they went on to push the H-47 even farther, coming out with the H-47G. So now I have a 54,000 max, uh, pound max gross weight helicopter, can pick up uh, 24,000 pounds of cargo, or up to uh, 55 passengers, 24 stretchers, and it has an aerial refueling probe. So this is what uh, special ops units in the Army are using. So this aircraft is flying successfully today. Okay, enough of Piasecki. Let's talk about Bell and Arthur Young. So again, Bell was a, uh, Arthur was an inventor. So uh, Larry Bell, who founded Bell Helicopters, wasn't an aviator. He was a, a philanthropist, a corporatist, but he saw the aviation business as a profit-making industry. So Bell Aircraft was making fighters and bombers before and throughout World War II, but he saw this rotary wing uh, revolution coming on the horizon. He wanted to be part of it, so he hired himself an innovator in uh, Arthur Young. And what was Arthur's uh, big innovation was working with models. So Arthur just wasn't working on uh, pencil and paper. He was actually making remote controlled models that he could fly around and test his different rotary wing theories on how everything worked. And through that testing, they actually came out with Bell's uh, first helicopter here, the Model 30. Now the Model 30 is a single rotor, and tail rotor configured aircraft. Again, 
falling into that a basic design criteria that Igor had previously patented. But you had to come out with something new. So they did come out with something new, and they put what's called a stabilization bar, or stab bar, working at 90 degrees to the main rotor system with weights out on the end, which gave you a tremendous increase in basic uh, stability and maneuver and control of the aircraft. So that's how they patented it and were able to come up with their single rotor, tail rotor configuration. They built three models of the uh, Model 30. So the second one had side-by-side -side seating and an enclosed cockpit, and they actually flew it. So one of the things you wanna see in the background on this is the nice facilities as opposed to Frank Piasecki's facility before this, which was basically a chicken ranch. A new type helicopter has been developed by the Bell Aircraft Corporation. Incorporating important new principles of rotary wing design, the major features of this helicopter include its stability in flight, simplicity of design, and precision control. So here you're working with a, an already established uh, aircraft company, Bell Aircraft. So they have all of the, the wonderful facilities that the Bell fixed wing people are able to have. Well, they continued developing that and actually b uh, making an open framework one, which was the basis for the uh, H-47, uh, the Bell bubble helicopter, which we'll see in a minute. But he also investigated a coaxial system. So all of our engineers at one time or another investigated both no tar, no tail rotor, and coaxial systems. Because with coaxial, obviously you eliminate the torque and everything goes to the development of lift. But they had vibration problems, so they stayed with the single rotor, main rotor. Now again, Larry Bell was a marketer. He wanted money. He wanted profit from this rotary wing industry. And so he told his engineers, you know, I want you to make a corporate helicopter. So in 1945, they came out with the uh, Model 42, which was designed for corporate use. And if you look at the front of it, you can see it looks a lot like a, an automobile. In fact, he actually hired automotive engineers to design the front of his helicopter. And it had regular automotive doors on it. It had rolled down windows. It had an ashtray inside. So it had all of the accoutrements inside that you would see in a high-end automobile of the same period. However, the, the market just wasn't there. So if you'll excuse the pun, it wasn't a flyer market-wise. So they went back to smaller helicopters, the Bell Bubble configuration, building the, the 47 and refining that to the 47 Alpha, which the military used as a light logistics helicopter and a training helicopter. So it's called the HTL by the Navy. But Larry Bell wasn't dissuaded. He still wanted to build that uh, corporate helicopter. In fact, now he was looking at the 47. He said, I can make a helicopter that anybody can afford, and everybody can have one in their garage. So he built the Model 47B uh, right here in 1947. The problem was, again, the market wasn't there. So it suffered from uh, very high maintenance cost, and it was very expensive. So at this time, uh, it was only $25,000. Now, but by today's standard, that doesn't sound like very much, but in 1947, that was a lot of money. You could probably buy two family homes for $25,000. So his, his uh, aircraft was quite expensive. Again, didn't fly. So he continued on developing the Model 47 into the 47G, the traditional MASH helicopter. So he wanted three seats up in the front because Stanley Hiller had three seats in his helicopter. So Bell wanted three seats in his also. And he put skids out there, eliminating the wheels, so it came a lot easier to maintain. Uh, and this is now your traditional MASH helicopter. Well, Bell went on to more innovation and gas turbine technologies. And one of the things that people probably don't realize is that Bell actually made a tandem rotor helicopter. So this is the Bell HSL, which in the day, in the early 1950s, was a beast of a machine. So it weighed in at over 26,000 pounds max gross weight. And it was designed basically for uh, mine sweeping and for a dipping sonar. Uh, unfortunately, they had a couple of wrecks early on in the program, uh, so the Navy decided to cancel the contract. Even though they bit, built over 50 of them, uh, apparently none of them survived. But this is sort of my personal holy grail of helicopters. So I think there's one of these sitting in a cornfield in Iowa somewhere that just nobody stumbled across yet. 
But when they do, we're going to make sure we get it in our museum. So gas turbine technology came on again, was a big boon for the uh, Bell Company, and they developed the Model 204, 205, the Huey. So a basic small uh, troop and cargo moving helicopter, which was one of our primary helicopters uh, during Vietnam. Building a smaller version, they had the Jet Ranger, the Model 206, and, uh, which was actually a nice little training and corporate helicopter. And you'll see many of these flying worldwide today. In fact, this is the one that I got my basic uh, helicopter training in with the Navy. So the Army wanted so a gunship. They wanted something that they could not only put people in, they wanted something that they could put ordnance on. So what they did was they take the basic Huey airframe, they slendered it down, uh, they just made a tandem seating configuration. They used the same uh, rotor dynamics for the main, the main rotor and the tail rotor. They put stub wings on it to carry ordnance, and they had the Cobra. And the Cobra is still successfully flying today. So this is the current Cobra, the AH-1 Zulu, the Zulu Cobra, or the Marines call it the Viper. But now it has twin engines, so it used the same engine configuration as the S-70 uh, in the Sikorsky aircraft. They also did the same thing to the Huey, come out with the Yankee model Huey called the Venom, which has the same uh, dynamic components and engine components as the uh, Viper before it. But now we have a, uh, a semi-rigid four-bladed rotor system giving it increased maneuverability and the engines giving it increased uh, pickup capability. So the original 204 maxed out at about 9,500 pounds, whereas the new uh, Super Huey and uh, the Cobra max out at 18 .5, 18, 000, over 18,000 pounds. So Bell wanted to uh, do other innovations too, so they investigated the tilt rotor concept. So this is the XV3 back in the mid-1950s, uh, where you could uh, tilt it over, you had a, a st a stub airplane wings on it, and now I could get increased uh, airspeed in forward flight. In fact, the XV-15 could go from a hover mode up to 250 knots by tilting it over. It was successful, they did tilt it over. However, they also had vibration and instability problems with the machine, although it flew for many years, ha uh, having over 250 flights. In conjunction now with Fairchild, so they became Fairchild Hiller, as we'll see later on, but they built a ducted fan vertical lifting aircraft. So this is the X-22 tilt flan, so basically using ducted props for uh, propulsion. Uh, but from the XV-15 and with their further technology through the ducted fan, they came out with the XV-15, so the first uh, successful tilt rotor, which was basically an RDT test and evaluation aircraft, which uh, the military at Pax River, the Navy at Pax River primarily, flew through many years before the Bell Boeing was finally able to develop the V-22 Osprey as a successful aircraft. So these have been successfully flying in Afghanistan, Iraq, throughout the United States. And even fact, the Marines are the primary user, but now the Navy is buying a version of the uh, tilt rotor to be used as an onboard cargo delivery aircraft for aircraft carriers. So the current one is a fixed wing, the, uh, the uh, C2 COD. Uh, is a fixed wing aircraft, so they're looking at the replace that with the uh, CV-22, which will be headquartered out of uh, North Island, Naval Air Station North Island in San Diego. Uh, there's also a civil version of the tilt rotor, the AW-609 for Augusta Westland. It originally started out as the AB-609 for Augusta Bell, but then uh, Westland uh, bought the rights and now it's, but it is a civil tilt rotor version. And they even have the follow-on aircraft right here, the V-280 Valor, which has taken certain lessons learned with the V-22 and upgraded them into uh, the middle of this century for improved performance and cargo lift capability. Ah, now let's talk about the original young gun, Stanley Hiller. Keep in mind, as I said before, Stanley was only a teenager, and his first aircraft, the XH-44, was a coaxial aircraft. Stanley Hiller Jr. was just 17 in 1942 when he started to build his first helicopter. By the time he was 19, it was finished, and he flew it for the first time in the University of California Stadium on May 14, 1944.
Mother's coaxial rotor system was extremely effective. Yeah, it was very effective and very stable. So that's the nice thing about a coax helicopter is all of your engine goes through the production of lift. There's no torque problem. And so it's a very stable aircraft. And we've seen with Sikorsky and Bell, they're both going back to that uh, coaxial configuration. The Russians love it. If you just Google Russian helicopters, you'll see tons of coaxial helicopters. They love them. But Stanley went on to build a tremendous uh, coax helicopter here, the H-235, which was an extremely rigid rotor system. In fact, look at the people standing out on the end of the rotor blades. Can you imagine doing that with a Robinson? But unfortunately, there was no market for it, so he had to go in another direction. Again, he wanted to get into that civil market, so he built this, the UH-4 commuter, back in the mid-1940s as everybody's helicopter. Unfortunately, like uh, Bell had learned before that, the market wasn't there. But it's a beautiful little coaxial helicopter. So he got back into the single main rotor and tail rotor configured helicopter, building the UH-12 uh, or the OH-23 Raven. Now, uh, Stanley had to come up with something new and unique uh, so he could get around Igor's patent. And what he did was develop the rotormatic control system. So it had a bar sticking out at 90 degrees to the main rotor system, similar to the stabilization bar that uh, Bell had. But instead of weights on the end, he had two little winglets. So there was two actual airfoil paddles on the end. And so when you move the controls in the cockpit, you move the cyclic and collective, you move the paddles. The paddles then aerodynamically move the rest of the rotor system. So even in small helicopters, the forces required up on the dynamic components are quite heavy. So consequently, even small helicopters are boosted of some sort. They got a hydraulic boosting system, just like power steering in your car. But that's extra weight and complexity that Stanley wanted to do away with, so his rotormatic system allowed him to do that. So now with uh, easy control, I can control the helicopter. And it was extremely stable. The military loved it, and they used it as a training helicopter. Okay, Stanley's moving on then. He still loved that small helicopter and wanted to get into the civil market, so he built the HJ-1 Hornet, a jet engine powered helicopter. Now, it wasn't powered by turbojets, it was powered by ramjets. And anybody who's familiar with a ramjet, knows it's nothing more or less than a hollow tube. That's all it is, with a flame supporter inside. So you got to get it going before you reach the right fuel to air pressure to actually light off uh, the uh, fuel to air mixture and get some propulsive force out of it. Well, the Army saw this, and the Army loved it. And they go, man, maybe we can't have our flying Jeep, but we like this, because I can put this on the back of a half track, take it up to the front, light it off, go around, see stuff, Take it, uh, come back and land and take it away. So they developed the uh, H-32 Hornet. So again, a ramjet powered helicopter. And there's very funny stories associated with the Hornet, which I just don't have time to get into today. But we do have one at our museum. Here it is right here. So this is us flying the Hornet on the ramp at Ramona Airport. And flying this is Mark in the back row right there. Raise your hand, Mark. It isn't as noisy as it might seem. It's no noisier than a regular helicopter. In fact, it, it kind of makes a, a hoofing sound like a steam engine or something. Very unique helicopter. There was only 24 of those ever made. We have two of them at Classic Rotors. And to my knowledge, I think we got the only flying one in the world. But you can come down and see that. So Stanley also developed a NOTAR. And this is his uh, J-5, uh, he called it the Jet Torque helicopter. But again, no tail rotor. Uh, unfortunately, he did fly it, but the, the engine power required simply wasn't sufficient to give you enough uh, anti-torque and yaw control in the back uh, from the compressed air thrust in the back. He also uh, went on to uh, develop this, the uh, XROE rotor cycle. So the rotor cycle was part of a, a military contract. They wanted a small, compact helicopter that they could parachute into the field, it could man up, and the pilot could fly himself out, supposedly without killing himself, but we're not too sure about that. But just a small, compact, single-person helicopter. And that's the only one he ever made. But in this picture, you can see two interesting aspects of Stanley Hiller. So Stanley Hiller believed in the KISS principle. 
Everybody knows what that is, right? Keep it simple. But what I say in my math class is student. I can't call him stupid. So it's keep it simple, student. But he believed in the, the KISS principle. And so you can see that arc in front of the pilot. What that arc in front of the pilot is, is the cyclic stick. So Stanley's cyclic stick went from right here in front of him directly up to the rotor head. So there was no intervening uh, mechanism below the seat and in the back that had to take that uh, movement up to the rotor head. So again, it eliminated a lot of extra weight and complexity. He also developed this, the VZ1 uh, Pawnee, the flying platform. So the flying platform has two ducted fan rotors in it turning in opposite directions and it was designed to carry soldiers around the battlefield. But you can imagine a whole company or even a, a battalion of these things flying around the battlefield, they'd probably be bouncing off one another like ping pong balls. So basically the army never picked it up as a viable concept. It did fly and you controlled it just like you control a Segway, just by leaning your body weight. So that was the control mechanism. We want one of these two in our museum. We haven't found one yet. If you find one laying around, let us know. Stanley went on now in conjunction with Her Fairchild Aircraft and they built a tilt wing. So the tilt wing uses two gas turbines with counter-rotating props on the, on, the, on the end of them to pick the airplane up and then actually transition into forward flight. So they built that just basically as a, a RDT&E test and evaluation type aircraft. Now Stanley had a lot of unique configurations and one of them was this. It was called his Model 1094 Camel. So Camel stands for Collapsible Airborne Military Equipment Lifter. So I called this his Transformer Helicopter. It was a fold-up helicopter. This is it hanging from the ceiling of our museum hangar at Ramona. But you can see the skids folded up along the sides, the tail boom folded back, the blades came off. You put everything in a big cargo net and you could parachute it into the field. Soldiers would then put it together in literally a matter of minutes, less than 10 minutes, they're going to have it all put it together. Find someone who thinks they know something about flying helicopters and actually transport six people out of the field. Well, luckily, they never tried that in real life. This is the only one they ever made. It's uh, just a, a, a technology demonstrator but we managed to acquire it. It's hanging in our museum. They also had a competitor with the Huey. So this is their uh, Model 1099 ASH, which stands for Assault Support Helicopter. But it was a single little gas turbine helicopter that was designed to compete with the Huey for that contract. So Bell won that contract. He also built a small competitor for the Loach, the uh, Light Observation Helicopter, which was won by Hughes with the Hughes 500 but that was uh, Stanley's uh, package into that uh, program right there. Okay, let's talk about Charlie Command. So Charlie Command, again, started off in his uh, mid-20s uh, in his mom's garage. So I call this uh, uh, Charlie's uh, tractor helicopter. And it wasn't really designed to fly, but it did use tractor parts. And what he was trying to do was demonstrate and improve his servo flap mechanism. So unlike regular helicopters, which use uh, a mechanism going direct up to the head and a series of swash plates to control the rotors, Stanley controls would go out through the rotor blades themselves and go to a flap that was at the trailing edge of the rotor blade and move the flap. So just like an aileron or an elevator. So his uh, were servo flap controlled, which actually had started back in the 1920s, but nobody perfected it until uh, Charlie Command came along. So his first successful helicopter then was uh, an intermeshing helicopter called his Model 125. Now Stanley didn't go with the single rotor tail rotor, he went in a completely another direction. He liked that intermeshing rotor system like that, that the Germans had developed during World War II. So Fletten, the Flettner uh, had developed that during World War II. So Stanley liked that a lot and he made his first helicopter that way and here it is flying. Charles Command was a passionate believer in the side-by-side -side intermeshing rotor system. His first helicopter was powered by a small 125 horsepower Lycoming engine. It was obvious to Command that while power weight ratio was important for fixed wing aircraft, it was absolutely crucial for helicopters. You can imagine the nickname that got. So the nickname that got was the egg beater. It's not a fly, it's not a banana, it's an egg beater. But it's an extremely stable platform. 
He went on and expanded that to his Model 225, which was the basis for the one that he put the gas turbine engine in. His production models, though, kept reciprocating engines. So he still had some problems with the gas turbine, but he was the first one to uh, try that innovation. He put some uh, fuselage skin on it, and some better stabilization tails in the back, and built his Model 240, also called the HTK, which the military liked for basic helicopter training and uh, light logistics, uh, whatever they need to move around, people and cargo-wise. He expanded that into his uh, HOK, HUK, which were the two designations for the Marines and the Navy, which was now a four-place helicopter with a reciprocating engine, also called the H-43 Alpha. So this was the first Husky. The Husky really didn't get Husky, though, until they put a gas turbine on it. So this is the H-43 Bravo, the Husky with a gas turbine, and it had uh, cargo doors in the back, a very uh, stable platform that the military liked for search and rescue, medevac, and firefighting. The Air Force used it for firefighting on all their major bases. In fact, our first uh, medevac and SAR helicopters in Vietnam were H-43 Huskies. So they started flying back there in the early 1960s. Well, Stanley, uh, actually, he liked this uh, intermeshing rotor system so much, he hired Anton uh, Flettner, who was the German aircraft engineer that developed this back in Germany, and they successfully flew it throughout World War II. Well, Anton uh, came back as part of the paperclip program, uh, and then uh, uh, Charlie hired him in the 1950s to be his head engineer for his intermeshing rotor system projects. Well, his current most uh, successful modern one then is the K-Max, which came out in the early 1990s. So the K-Max is designed as basically a lifter. It's an airborne crane, and it's designed to pick up loads. A single piloted can pick up uh, 8,000 to 10,000 pound cargo loads and just take them from here to there. You'll see them lifting things like power poles for power lines and things like that, air conditioning units. Whatever we need to pick up, we can pick it up. So this even got, into, uh, got heavy into industry, and even the Navy uh, uh, investigated its uh, performance for vertical replenishment aboard cargo ships. And they did actually do that evaluation uh, for a couple years with the Navy. Well, the Marines actually got a hold of it and made a drone helicopter out of it. So this is the CQ-24 UAV, unmanned aerial vehicle, that the Marines used for drone operations for carrying cargo, drone-wise, in uh, Afghanistan. So they used it for several years successfully there. They still have it down at uh, Miramar. There's Charlie, incidentally, with his Ovation guitar. So I flew uh, helicopters in the Navy. So I flew H, uh, H3s, which was the Sikorsky S61, and H46s. So our joke among helicopter pilots was uh, Charlie made a good guitar, but he sort of dropped the bubble when it came to helicopters, which is really unfair. He made quite successful helicopters, the H2 being one of them, which is a small, compact shipboard helicopter designed for anti-submarine and anti-ship type warfare with a retractable landing gear, a radar system on board, a very, very uh, versatile helicopter, which is still flying today as the H2 Golf. Uh, again, with a beefier twin engine uh, pack on it. But the Australians are flying these, the, the, the Kiwis, the New Zealanders are still flying them. Poland is flying them. They have a Polish Navy and they're flying the H2 Gulf. The Egyptians are flying them. So it's still used by various countries around the world. He also investigated the tip jet concept. In other words, uh, how do I get rid of that tail rotor by eliminating the torque and just have a tip powered rotor system. He beefed up the Husky into his Model 1125 Husky 3, which was a passenger transport helicopter. Unfortunately, he never got into the civilian market, but again, it was a very stable platform, could carry up to 12 uh, passengers or uh, several thousand pounds of cargo. One of his most interesting projects was this, and this is the KSA-100 Saver, which stands for Stowable Aircrew Vehicle Escape Rotor Seat. What it was, it was a, if you can believe this, it was a gyrocopter with a turbine engine on it, and it was designed to be built into the ejection system of a jet fighter. 
So it was all under and behind the seat. They actually flew it many times successfully. They never put it in the fighter, though the Air Force sort of frowned on that. But it was interesting. So if he ejected, the whole thing, the rotors and everything would boom, just deploy out like that in a matter of seconds. They'd light off the gas turbine and he could take it at 100 knots for a range of 50 to 75 miles. Amazing, and they actually successfully flew it. So indeed, Charlie was an innovator. So now we come up to modern day with uh, Frank Robinson. And again, Frank was a mechanical engineer. So he had a degree in mechanical engineering, uh, but he wanted to uh, make helicopters. So after he graduated, he decided to learn out how to do this. So he got hired by Cessna to work on their Skyhook program. This is the only helicopter that Cessna aircraft ever made. Uh, they weren't too successful with it. They were much more successful with their fixed-wing aircraft. But he worked for uh, several years with them. He then went on to work for a company called UMBA, U-M-B-A-U-G-H, UMBA, the UMBA Aircraft Company that uh, was building gyrocopters. So he got to work in that industry and find out about light, uh, light aircraft rotor systems. He then went to work for McCulloch for seven years, now learning how to make light aircraft engines. Frank's whole philosophy was he didn't want to get pigeonholed in any kind of a position anywhere and having to work the same job day after day, year after year. He wanted to know how everything worked, how to make it work, and how to sell it. And so he wanted to get different positions with all these companies. He worked for a Bell helicopter, becoming a tail rotor expert with the Bell helicopter company. And then he finally worked for Hughes, spending several years working for Hughes on their tail rotor program for the Hughes 500 and on the quiet helicopter program. So one of the noisiest things, believe it or not, on helicopters is the tail rotor. In fact, that's how we learned to fly formation in the S-61. You flew close enough until you could hear the tail rotor, then you didn't go any closer. That's as close as you got. So the tail rotors are quite noisy, and that's what the quiet helicopter program was working on. Well, uh, Frank offered his small helicopter, which by this time he had designed. He had it down on paper, and he offered it to Bell and Hughes, both of which turned up their noses at it, because basically they were heavily involved with lucrative military contracts at the time. So Frank said, okay, enough of you guys. So in 1973, he went out on his own and formed Robinson Helicopters, basically out of his house. And if you listen to uh, the previous uh, presentation by uh, Frank's son, you, you heard that basically the kids didn't know what regular family furniture was. They thought it was drafting tables and hoist to, uh, to lift engines with. <laughs> that was uh, Kurt's words. Uh, Frank continued, he's putting together his helicopter. He finally gets a small hangar right here at Torrance Airport and finalizes this R-22 Raven. So the first truly compact small helicopter that basically anybody could afford and anybody could learn how to fly. So now he's realizing that dream of all of the other engineers to build a helicopter, one for every garage. Luckily, it hasn't been one for every garage. Can you imagine the traffic problems in LA? There he is right there. Clear. So this is Frank cranking up his uh, helicopter. See if you recognize that voice. The R-22 has been designed to be as simple to fly as possible. But in the hands of its creator, it can put on a stunning display of maneuverability under perfect control. So the voice you heard there, anybody recognize it? It's the man from UNCLE, right, Robert Vaughn. So he was the narrator for Frank's uh, production right here. And if you come to a Classic Rotors, you'll be able to see the whole video. So it's, it's a long one. It's, what, 30 minutes long or something like that. So you'll be able to see the whole thing along with our R22 uh, display now that we have in our museum. Well, he went on to make bigger and better things, expanding his R-22 into the R-44 Raven II by the early 1990s. Now we have a, a four-place helicopter that uh, can actually do instrument flight, uh, but a very versatile little helicopter, again, flown all over the world. 
by the 21st century, 2010 here, he expands that again with gas turbine technology to the R66, a five-place turbine-powered helicopter, powered with a Rolls-Royce turbine. So we're talking about high end for Frank and his production. If you ever get a chance to visit Robinson Helicopters right down the street right there, you should do it. It's absolutely amazing. I'm blown away every time I go down there and see the production operation down there at uh, Robinson Helicopters. Okay, well that's all of our pioneers. But one last word here on Classic Rotors Museum. So there's our front entrance. We have a 100 by 100 by 30 foot hangar with 37 helicopters and over 100 related items on display in it, both upstairs and downstairs. We have a gift shop. We have absolutely the best restrooms in all of Ramona. <laughs> absolutely, I guarantee it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can hover on the toilet. Uh, we have an outdoor covered picnic area, so if you want to eat your lunch or just rest in the shade. We have uh, four restoration hangers. That's one of our restoration hangers. We have a complete machine shop where you can actually machine components. We have an 18-seat movie theater. We have a complete library and a conference room, all wired uh, so you can bring in your laptop, your uh, whatever you got, and just uh, plug it in and play it right there, all air conditioned. Well, that's the end of my uh, thing, so any questions? Is the restoration area open to the public, was the question. So we try to keep the tours inside the museum hangar, but for special people, we can give you the cook's tour and take you behind the scenes so you can uh, see some of our restoration. And we're a working museum, so you'll actually see restoration projects going on in the museum. But we can tell you, take you behind the scenes, too, even take you to our movie theater. Yes, sir. Uh, the question was, what was the helicopter that was used in the Bin Laden raid? Well, in the Bin Laden raid, they used uh, a variation of the H-60 with a special uh, super secret uh, tail rotor and tail configuration design on it. Unfortunately, they crashed one of them there, and the SEALs had to destroy that. Unfortunately, they didn't destroy all of it, but, you know. They got the, the mission was completed. Let's just say that. The question was on our logo is that the Leonardo da Vinci drawing? And yes, it is. So that's his helix. And you can see the dates from uh, 1493 when he originally did it up to 1993, which was pretty much when a uh, classic rotor started 500 years. So we configure that our, our first helicopter, even though it what you know by today's standard it wasn't a helicopter, you'd have to drop it off the Tower of Pisa, but it would uh, circle on down. Uh, the question was, Leonardo da Vinci had a few designs. Yes, that's correct. Leonardo da Vinci had more than a few designs. If you just want to get, spend a day in the, uh, go down to the main, uh, I guess you can Google it now. Just Google Hel uh, Leonardo da Vinci's designs and you'll sit there all day long. Okay, so the question was, is the museum open all week long or only certain days? So we're open uh, Friday, Saturday, and Tuesday. Yeah, Friday, Saturday, and Tuesday from basically about 9 to uh, 4 or 5. Yeah. And the best day to come is Saturday because that's when most of us are there working. You can see all the projects going on. And again, remember, we have the best restrooms in Ramona. <laughs> so there's a lot of little eating establishments in Ramona also. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Come down and see us. Thank you for watching Peninsula Seniors Out and About. I'm Betty Wheaton. See you next time.